Okay, stream has begun. Welcome everybody to what hopefully will actually be the last uh, message on Matthew 11. I feel like I've said it for like three weeks, um, but we covered, as you guys remember, if you remember last week, we covered a lot on Pride um, and how that filters in. Oh, sorry, I got distracted by my phone because I'm ADD. Um, how that filters into the Christian life. So uh, hopefully we'll get through this today. We'll see. Um, I have a few random questions from people to address before we really get into it. So let's do that. I'm going to, I'm going to go ahead and pray for us today and then I'll address the questions and then we'll cover the rest of this passage. So dear Lord, I, I need, I need you today, Lord. I need you so I can spread this message. I need you so I can speak truth, Lord. I, I'm just a guy, Lord. And, um, I want to just be someone who can represent you in a way that just, um, is truthful about what your word is and finds the deepness in the word and can explain it in a way that other people might be able to rejoice in knowing truth um, that they didn't know before and understanding something that they didn't get before, Lord, and um, be at least one of many uh, people who stand actually interpreting the word of God as it was meant to be interpreted in this world where there's so many people who just don't respect it at all um, and don't understand it at all. And it's because they don't care and they don't actually, um, desire to study Lord. So I pray that you bless this time and make my words, your words for this, uh, study. Amen. All right. Uh, again, I'll answer a few questions. Um, same stuff. If you want to say anything, ask anything, you can do so by in the general chat or by in the questions chat or by unmuting and yelling at me, please do all those things as much as possible. Um, because then I get to interact with you guys more. Uh, so let's see. So I think we uh, we addressed this question last week. Um, so there's a couple of random Toka questions. So we'll just get through these really quick. The first one is, is it a sin to procreate a child? The child will definitely make many sins in its life. And this means you are essentially creating sins. Um, so this kind of... Um, I feel like this is tangential to the question we answered that last week, which is, should you kill children? Or maybe it was two weeks ago. Should you kill children so you can send them to heaven instead of hell? I, um, I, I, it's kind of like a weird question, but the answer to this one's really simple. No, you don't cre you're not creating sins. You're not sinning by procreating for two reasons. Number one, the Bible commands that we should be fruitful and mu multiply. Some people say that that commandment from the Old Testament doesn't apply to the New Testament world. I would say that there was never a, a revocation of that in the New Testament. But either way, it, it was said, it was at one point an actual command to be fruitful and multiply. But the other thing is, we we have continued to define sin a lot on this um, uh, these times together, and we understand that sin is something that is a choice by an individual to rebel against God, or in the simplest sense, to not love God perfectly, right? That's sin, right? That's a choice, right? Um Yes, it is basically impossible for a human being not to make that choice because they are born with a sin nature, which means an internal spirit that is unredeemed and therefore bent towards doing sin. But you're not actually forcing that person to sin um, by creating them. They choose to sin in their heart afterwards, right? Um, so no, you're not sinning by procreating. Um, I feel like it's as simple as that. Uh, why doesn't God make it so nothing is a sin? That way nobody goes to hell. That's one of those big questions. With um, Again, well, we could do a full study on a question like that. You can request that in the study topic request on Discord if you want a full exposition. But again, the basic answer is that um, when God created man, he now, of course, he already knew what was going to happen, and he planned and purposed for everything, and so then... It can get confusing, like, oh, well, did he make it happen, or did he just know it's happening? Whatever. That's that's why we need the whole study. But the basic idea is that he created man, and he created them innocent. So without sin, even though they had the potential to choose wrong, they didn't have a nature to choose wrong. Um, with it, they were without sin, and they could choose to do wrong or not. And God said, don't eat from the tree. Um, and they ate from the tree. They chose to do bad, and therefore they brought sin into the world, and of course the death and the hell that comes with that as a consequence, because they chose that. Right, so um, God didn't set the world, set them up for failure. They had, they made a choice and failed. Um, so it's not like 
to ask this question that he asks is kind of to imply that God made sin, and so therefore he can just kind of unmake sin, right? Why did like why doesn't he make it that nothing's a sin, as he says? Uh, but that would then again impede on our the choice God gives us. Without choice, there is no real love, and God created us to glorify him and love him, right? So uh, I would say, I mean, again, this is that's one of the questions that we could use a whole study for. Um, so don't take this as the finality answer. But the basic is that um, he made us to make the to have a choice to uh, do wrong or to not. Um, Adam, oh, the other point I'll make is Adam being the best representative of humankind. So people ask the question, oh, well, maybe if Adam didn't didn't sin, then no one would have sinned. Adam and Eve, um, the Bible talks about that being that being the best representation representation of humankind, which means that Adam represented every person who ever lived and came from him in the way that he acted, which is to say that if Adam, if you replaced Adam with somebody else who'd come after him, they would have done the same thing, is the is the basic idea there. Again, to argue that, we would need a, another full hour for that. So Adam made a choice that all of humanity would have made, um, but it wasn't forced upon him. Anyway, moving on. I think, uh, uh, I'll... I also have like another point that can be made like in regards to just making everything not a sin. And I think it's, I think the th key thing here is that sin is just defined as anything that goes against God's nature. Right. So it's not like God can like violate his own nature by defining basically what, by saying any, by making anything not a sin, he'd be violating his own nature. That's true. I, I think that, um, and that deals with the wording of the question better, so thanks for kind of pointing that out. He is saying, why doesn't God just make it so nothing is a sin? Which kind of um, points to that the question is asking, okay, why doesn't he just make all the things we know as currently sins, not sins? And I think what you make a good point. Like, sin is sin is an operation outside of God's nature, against not God's nature, not loving God perfectly. Um, it, it's not like you know, God can't just be like, hey, you know what? Murder's not a sin anymore, right? Because um, sin is just, evil is not a force. It's not a substance. It's just simply the absence of um, perfection, the absence of God's nature, the absence of loving God in perfection, right? Um, evil is the absence of good, not a force equal and opposite to good. Um, good is a force because good is the is a word we use to just in its purest form, to describe the nature of God, and God is certainly a force. So, um, that's again, a bunch of words that we would need an hour or two message if we wanted to unpack that question in its fullness with all the scriptures and blah, blah, blah. Um, so, study topic request, it's there in the Discord, which everyone should join. Um, moving on. If we believe something is a sin, but do it anyway, and then find out it's not actually a sin, and I have... Uh, have I still sinned by thinking I am sinning yet continuing to do it even if that sin wasn't even a sin? Yes, and I would point you to Romans 14, I think, on that. Um, because, um, or the passage where it talks about eating food sacrificed to idols. I forget which passage that is. I think it's Corinthians. Do you, do you remember Nighthawk? Please remember. Um, you know what I'm talking about, right? Um I know what you're talking about. Let me and look it up. I... Eating food sacrificed to idols passage. Because it, it, oh, I'll make this point. Because I think that's still Romans 14, though. No, it's First Corinthians. It's Corinthians. There's, there's, there's a mention of it there. I think Corinthians uh -huh. eight. So let me let me answer this question by showing you this passage. So it says now concerning food offered to idols. Right. We know that all of us possess knowledge and this knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. Right. So it's already setting it. This is this message is more towards someone uh, towards a Christian who's mature, telling them, OK, if it offends a weaker Christian, don't eat food offers to idols because, you know, even though you know that it's not a sin to do that. Right, because you don't want to offend the weaker Christian because it would hurt their conscience. So I can make my point here by showing you this passage, but I'll have to show you the kind of the, the other half of it. Um, if anyone imagines that he knows something yet does yet does not yet he does not yet, yet know as he ought to know, but if anyone loves God, he's known by God. Sorry. So therefore, as to the eating of food offered to idols, right? 
in regard to this topic. We know that an idol has no real existence and that there is no God but one. So what he's saying is the eating of food offered to idols is not really a big problem. It's not a sin. It's not a it's not an issue because an idol is not a thing anyway. There's no such thing as a sacrificed food to idols because idols aren't anything. Um, as a Christian, a mature believer, we'd know that there's there's only one God, right? For although there may be so-called gods in heaven and on earth, as indeed there are many gods and many lords, yet for us there is one God, the Father, from whom all are, are all things and for whom we exist, and one Lord Jesus Christ, through whom are all things and through whom we exist. So reiterating the fact that as a Christian, we believe what is true is that there's only one God, right? So if, if you offer an idol, uh, I mean, you offer food to a wood statue, as a Christian, that's nothing happened there. That would, you just said words, nothing actually occurred because I know there's only one God, right? Um, seven, verse seven. However, not all possess the knowledge. But some, through former association, so they used to live in that pagan life where they offered food to idols, with idols, eat food as really offered to an idol, and their conscience being weak is defiled. Do you understand what's happening here? It's talking about someone who used to be pagan, right, is eating the food that was previously, that it was offered to idols, um, and it defiles their conscience because their conscience is weak. So they used to live in that lifestyle so their conscience tells them that eating food offered to idols is an actual thing. I'm actually eating food offered to another god. Because as a weak believer, they don't really yet in their body, in their heart, understand that, that it's nothing anyway. So they're defiled, right? Their conscience, their mind is defiled by doing it, even though it's not actually technically a sin, right? And so that would kind of answer that question. If you... Um, and I don't know... I guess I could kind of use the word sin um, in a sense um, because this would need some more exposition from other passages. But it does, if you do something that's not technically a sin, but your conscience was telling you don't do it because you believe it's a sin and you believe it dishonors the Lord, then you defile your conscience by ignoring it and doing it even if it's not technically a sin. Because in your mind, in your conscience, you're saying this action, doing this, would dishonor the Lord, even though the actual truth is it's not a sin technically. So you're still making a decision that you think dishonors the Lord, and so therefore in your heart, you're making a decision that dishonors the Lord, right? So you defile your conscience. So I would say that even if it's not a sin in the technical reality of the world, if you're doing something that you think is a sin, so what you're saying in your head is this action to, again, defile, um, I mean, dishonors the Lord, then you are actually sinning in your heart, even though the, the raw action is not a sin. So I would say if your conscience, and, and I'm, not, I'm not saying whatever you do, whatever your conscience says, because your conscience can be deceitful. But what I'm saying is that if you are studying the word and you feel, and your conscience is telling you, don't do this because it dishonors God, then don't do it, right? If you if you used to be an alcoholic and you're saved out of alcohol and even one glass of alcohol hurts your conscience because you feel like any alcohol is a sin and, and this is a dishonor to the Lord because I'm turning back to my old life, even though in reality it's not a sin to have one glass of alcohol, do not do it. Do not hurt your conscience. Do not sear your conscience. Okay? And that's kind of the Romans 14 passage too where it says some think some days are ceremony feast days that they need to follow in order to honor God. Some think every day is the same and there's no special days. There's no Sabbath, right? And both of them, remember the reality is there's, we don't really need the Sabbath anymore, but some think you, I need to honor the Sabbath to honor the Lord. So if they ignore that, then they're making a choice that they think dishonors God, which means they're making a hard choice, choice to dishonor God because they think it does. Right? So, um, Within the context of wanting to honor the Lord, listen to your conscience, okay? That would be my my answer on that. Um, of course, uh, just for the side note, Corinthians 8 is actually teaching that a mature Christian around this weaker Christian that would be defiled shouldn't eat the food sacrificed to idols or, you know, broader message, don't do something that would offend a weaker Christian um, because if it would defile their conscience. Because as a mature Christian, we shouldn't be about knowledge, verse two, this knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. We should be about love. I should say, so to 
further the other example, I should say to myself, I'm a mature, I can say to myself, I'm a mature Christian, so I realize that drinking some alcohol is okay and not sinful. I have a friend, pretend, and I might have this, um, I have a friend who uh, is a weak Christian, a new Christian, who was saved out of alcohol, and it is a big deal to him to avoid that, to honor the Lord, and he's affected greatly if with people even drinking around him. What kind of love am I showing if I'm like, oh, but like, it's not actually a sin if I drink this much and just drink around him and hurt his conscience and hurt our relationship and show that I don't care about him. I just care about having the knowledge, right? It says the knowledge that puffs up a reality, right? So see, that's the point of making. Um, love over over knowledge, it would be, I guess, side, side point. So um, hopefully that covers that uh, relatively well. Um, and then Toga has something else. I'm not, I'm not listening. I, well, I guess maybe we can open it. He says, not really that serious, just curious. If this was an actual song made unironically to bring kids to Christianity, would it be a sin? I'm clicking on the song. I have no idea what's coming up. Um, we have to watch an ad from And Blue here's Bunny. where we use real humans to make sure our new Blue Bunny Whoa. twist treats twist two flavors uh, together for the perfect amount of fun. Rap in for Jesus. So... Is the name of the, the song. perfect duo. Um, Ooh, what a twist! Blue Bunny, we make I'm not, fun. I'm not really sure what's about to happen here. I don't remember watching the entire thing, but I just remember when I started watching, I was like, this is absolute cringe. Um, I don't know what's about to happen. Oh. Well, I wrote this song for the Christian youth. I want to teach kids the Christian truth. If you want to reach those kids on the street, then you got to do a rap to a hip hop beat. Um, so I gave my sermon an urban. Okay, well, I'm just going to stop it uh, that early on and say that because he says if you reach, want to reach, I, I didn't want, first of all, the rap is cringy. If I actually wrote a rap uh, about Christ, even, I would do a lot better than this because I, I like rap a lot. And good flow and complex flow and having some speed and pacing in your rap is a huge deal to me. I actually like rap. Now, probably not all the songs I listen to are the most God-honoring, but the point is I really actually like rap. And so it really bothers me when I hear crappy rap like this because it's like, uh, it's like this is just, this is like the most basic 1960s form of just I should rhyme the words. That's literally the only thing, and there's no flow idea. Anyway, besides the point, um, like to say, hey, to reach the kids in the street, I need to rap to this beat or whatever you just said. You guys didn't even hear it on Discord because I didn't sharing on the Discord, just on the Chrome, the stream. Like that's I'm already have a problem with that because no, I don't need to go out of my way to be relevant to the culture in order to teach the gospel. So that's already wrong. I I'm I'm not even going to watch the rest of this because it's too cringy. Um, so I would say, no, you don't need to. I, I guess if you wrote a doctrinally sound rap and people came to Christ because you wrote a biblically doctrinally sound rap, fine. I mean, there's Christian rappers who write very complex, good songs like Caleb Gordon. Listen to Caleb Gordon. He's a good, I, I think he's a decent rapper. He's a pretty good rapper. He writes Christian songs. I think he's honest about himself and he's honest. He tries to be clear about God in them. And I think he does a pretty good job. And someone might listen to that and get a sense of God and that could help them come towards Christ. And no, it would not be a sin. Um, this song is just cringy, and so I don't think it's going to have much of an effect except for just mockery. But the point it's making that, like, you need to write a rap in order to reach the people in the street, I mean, that's not a, 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 true anyway, because um, we don't need to be more relevant to our culture to reach people with Christ. We don't need to change our method methodology of uh, expositing the word in order to reach... Now, I'm, I'm not saying that one size fits all with how you teach. I, you should listen to people and everyone's different, but I'm saying we don't need to go out of our way to look like the culture as much as possible, right? The way a lot of supposed evangelical churches are doing today, because that will bring people to Christ. No, I mean, we should be careful about how we share things and consider people, the p people we're talking to in the audience, but we don't need to like just become as relevant as possible in order to get the word across. So that's my thoughts on that. Um, uh, and then the last comment, uh, it's a sin either way. There's no such thing as a situational based sin. 
Um, I disagreed with that. That was like a response to the video thing, but um, situational based sins, I think, are the most relevant to the Christian life because re most Christians are not like, I'm struggling with murder. I mean, that's usually not the problem. It's usually living a wise life beyond reproach to Christ, um, unto Christ as a Christian. I mean, well, at least as they, I'm not saying maybe it's not the most difficult thing. I think a lot of people struggle with just pride, but, um, it is a big deal and it, how we interact with other people and show love to other people. And it was kind of like what I was just talking about. I, and I recommend Romans 14 as a read. Um, and I'll just pull it up here while we're talking about it so I can make the point with scripture. Romans 14. Why is Bible Gateway? Here we go. Um, let's see. Okay. Verse 5, Romans 14. One person esteems one day as better than another, while another esteems all days alike. Each one should be fully convinced in his own mind. This is the point I was making before. One person is saying is that one day, this is kind of referring to the Sabbath, which is like supposedly the important day out of the week. Like one day in the week is more important than all the other days. And someone's saying, other people saying, well, no, all the days are the same. There's no like important day. Every day is the same um, that we live. There's no like special days, right? And so what's saying each one, should be fully convinced in his own mind, meaning that basically it's okay to think either thing. Neither of the, they're, they're two different thoughts, they're two opposing ideas, but neither of them is a sin in and of itself, right? The one who observes the day observes it in honor of the Lord, right? The one who eats eats in honor of the Lord since he gives thanks to God, while the one who abstains abstains in the honor of the Lord and gives thanks to God. Basically, it's saying, look, the person who's convinced that the one day is better than the other observes that special day to honor God, right? And and the eats here would be someone who eats, uh, this is contextually to eating like only clean food by the Jewish law as opposed to eating all types of food, even the ones that were considered unclean in the Old Testament. So it's saying the one who eats in the honor of the Lord, he's eating that only clean fr food because he's giving thanks to God. He's doing it to honor God. And the one who's... Um, abstain oh no sorry eats like even the unclean food and the one who abstains like only eats the clean food abstains to honor god too right so it's saying see there's two different opposing scenarios and the people are choosing to do it both doing it to honor the lord there's not like a clear sin there therefore it is situational because um if you go against your conscience right if the person who's like i need to eat everything to honor god because everything's there's nothing that's unclean if they were to go against their conscience and start doing that, then they would be sinning. It would be situational, even though it's not technically a sin for everybody, right? Um, and if you and if you go further in the chapter where it says, like, uh, like verse thirteen and stuff, where it talks about uh, other believers not making believers stumble. Like, if you do something to and around someone who's offended by that, and you cause them to stumble, cause them to be offended in their faith, because it doesn't matter to you. You know, it's not a sin, but they don't really get that then that is also a situational sin because you're not doing something wrong, but you're causing that brother in Christ to stumble. So yes, sins can be situational. Um, again, that to dive into that, we'd need to study Romans 14, but we're not doing that tonight. Um, uh, let's see. That song has the N-word in it? That's crazy. That that song that, that it pulled up? <laughs> That's wild. <laughs> That's true. Or is that just words? Really? Uh, what a cringy song. I couldn't even listen to it. Okay, then that's that that is definitely not a song that's good. Um I wh whatever. But PC people are nonsense. What I don't understand people. Um, so those are, uh, anyway, basically all the questions. Um, so we can get into Matthew, finish up Matthew 11 here, hopefully relatively quickly. Yeah. Though I respond to his questions because at least his questions, it, I think his questions, rep, they seem silly, but they also represent a mind kind of like Gabe's mind 
which like they need to understand these details. Like they're actually asking because they're like, okay, well, this situation is a potential situation. And if the Bible is true and God's real and things are reasonable, then there should be an answer to this question, even though I don't really need the answer to this question. And so the, the ability to answer that question is more about the fact that it's demonstrating that God is thorough and reasonable in all things, then he actually needs this answer to progress in his life. Um, so I hope that's understood. Um, so I, I answered them just like Gabe was right. Because like when Gabe would say things to me, like, Oh, could God get OG cell skulls trooper from the shop and blah, blah, blah. I, I was just nonsense, right? Stupid questions. It's not because he needed the answer to that in order to progress in his faith, but he was at a place where he was trying to understand the scope of the reasonability of God. And he didn't even know that that was the case because I he wouldn't understand what I just said, I think, back then. But um, I think that like it was clear that from the way he would talk about those things and ask those questions that it wasn't it wasn't like Willow, who's just in here to mock uh, God. Like it was he was like actually trying to figure out. Um, uh, understand what the scope of God and his reality is and how it affects even simple things. Yeah, Toka is actually sincere. He Toka's just a little bit off the beam. Um, anyway, let's go into Matthew 11. So someone is going to now unmute and read Matthew 11, 25 to 30, and then we will study it. So someone do that. One of you guys. Maybe Cookie. Well, you want to hear, you want to hear something? Yeah, eleven twenty-five to thirty. Uh, hold up. Eleven twenty-five to thirty, you said. Yep. Okie dokie. All right, I found it. Um, at that time, Jesus said, "I praise you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and intelligent, and have revealed them to infants." Yes, Father, for this way was well pleasing in your sight. All things have been handed over to me by Father, and no one knows the Son except the Father nor does anyone know the Father except the Son, and anyone to whom the Son wills to reveal him. Come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, I don't know, laden. Um, laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and <clears throat> humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Thank you. Appreciate that. That is, I appreciate that. Anyway, um, let's take a look here. So last time we stopped at 25, right? Cause we made a point. We were like, okay, Jesus had just denounced all these cities because he had just done all these signs in the cities, Chorus in Bethsaida. And there was an indifferent response, right? Because these cities, um, took all the information about Jesus and was like, this is unimportant or this is not true, or this is, um, uh, not uh, relevant to me or whatever it is they responded to. They didn't respond to it, even though it was very clear. Jesus was raising the dead. He was teaching a, me a member. He taught, taught a message that people uh, it said that the Jews were astonished by it, right? They were affected by it. They were like, he speaks with authority and they were stumbling over it, right? This was not a benign message and it was supported by um, incredible and frequent uh, miraculous works, right? And even after all that, they were generally indifferent to him. And so they reaped judgment and so I, I want to make a point here. So when you're indifferent to Christ, especially after all that information, even if you don't say anything with your mouth or express it with your attitude, you're automatically someone who has intellectual pride. Because what you're saying is that even after reality is given to me, right, what we know as reality as Christians, that I don't, I don't need that. I know better than that. I know enough things without that reality that I can stay indifferent to that reality and still operate okay. And a lot of them thought that they were operating in a way that would get them into heaven. They were holy enough to be in heaven, 
right? In that in that particular culture and place. So they're like, I'm fine even without that information. But if you think you're fine without the only information that comes from God and gives you salvation, then from the perspective of a Christian or from Jesus who's speaking here, then you're operating with intellectual pride because you're like, okay, I have enough information or works or for myself to, to handle this, to handle life, right? And that's why he says what he says in verse 25 after denouncing these cities. He's like, he's praising God. He's saying, I praise you, Father, that you've hidden, right, these things. And what's these things? The message of, of Jesus about the kingdom, salvation, and what he's going to do and how he's come to save. If you've hidden these things from the wise and intelligent and revealed them to infants, right? You're hiding these things. Why, why would he do that? He's hiding those things from those who believe themselves wise and intelligent without the message he just gave. Right? Because remember the context, he's talking about these cities who have already expressed their indifference. Right? And then last week, we looked at all those passages on pride that shows the nature of someone who has a supposed wise intellectual mind, someone who supposedly knows um, enough, who supposedly has wisdom, who supposedly is, is um, already satisfied without um, Christ. Uh, and what that looks like, right? So that's why we dove in all the passages across across the Bible that just say anything regarding um, what pride does and the result of it, um, and it's in the foolishness of it. And so he says, uh, it's been revealed to infants. And then they briefly gave you passages that showed how much the believer is pictured like a child or a baby, right? Someone who is completely and utterly dependent on their creator or their maker or their father, right? As God's called. Um, and the trust is just completely there, even without the knowledge, right? When you talk about an infant, there's no, there's not a full knowledge of the father. There's just a full trust. You see the difference? There's not a full knowledge, right? Not everything is understood or grasped or um, reconciled together in, in, in philosophically, but if there is a full trust. And what keeps that child having faith in that father is not that they intellectually understand everything they can about the father, and that they've ascended to a knowledge equal to that of the Father. It's the continual, unchanging nature of the Father demonstrated by action in their life. And the demonstration that we get, analogous to what I'm describing, is the Bible that gives us those examples. And gives us a description of the God that was the same in Moses' time, 2,000 years later to Christ's time, 2,000 years later to this time. We are far from being able to ever reconcile everything about God, but we have been demonstrated enough that we can put our trust in it. And so Christians, even the strong, even the John MacArthur in the world, um, they're infants. They're infants relative to what can be known about God. They're infants relative to the power they, that God has. They're infants relative to all of the attributes of God. Um, but they are fully and utterly dependent on, on, on the Father, right? And that's necessary. That's what, I mean, I, I feel like every study I quote this, but Matthew 5, 3, blessed are the poor in spirit. That's where it starts. Um, that is uh, the, the Christian analogy to being an actual infant, right? Being, realizing that you have nothing inside of you. Because when it says wise and intelligent, it's not talking about actual wisdom and intelligence. It's talking about people who, even though the reality is that they are infants spiritually, they're pretending like they're not. They're pretending like they, they have um, maturity spiritually. But that only comes with God. That only comes by being dependent in the Father. And that maturity spiritually and that power and the life spiritually is not even you, even after you're a Christian. It's Christ in you. That's why Paul says we live as, um, and I'm not quoting a specific passage here, but he, he pe teaches generally that we live, Christ lives in us through us. The Holy Spirit works through us, right? Because it's really him doing it. Um, if we do one of Paul's letters after Matthew, we'll get the joy of really unpacking those more theological, um, you know, discourses. So, 
I hope that's making some sense from 25, right? So 26 says, yes, Father, for this way was well-pleasing in your sight. Now, I would say here that there's two things, there's two things here I think to think about. Number one is that Jesus is confirming and, and loving and um, standing by, right? Right, standing with um, something that is well-pleasing in the sight of the Father, which means that Jesus is in alignment with the Father. Okay? Right? So, um, for some something that is well-pleasing in the sight of the Father, right, is also well-pleasing in the sight of Christ. Because remember, Jesus is praising the Father, right, in verse 25, for this thing that we just talked about. And then he's saying, this thing I just praised, for you, praised you for, it's also pleasing in your sight, right? So it's kind of a um, implicit uh, demonstration of the fact that Jesus and the Father are on the same page. There's no miscommunication there. The, um, there's, uh, there's submitting and obedience and just, just perfect harmony between um, Christ and the Father in that sense. The other thing here is that we get to see a glimpse of the sovereignty of God here, right? Right, Because like something that is well-pleasing in the Father's sight would be something that the Father wills to be, right? This is something that the Father desires to be for the world. And exactly what he desires to be is exactly what the reality is, right? Because Jesus is praising him for it. So as pointing to the fact that what God wills to be is actually what is. Um, uh, I think that's really all there in 26. Uh, and then 27 kind of takes it further. You have all things have been handed over to me by my father, right? So we kind of acknowledge the father and what he's doing here. And then Jesus is saying, so all these things that are being accomplished by the father and are well pleasing to the father, they're all my responsibility. I am responsible for everything God is responsible for. I, I have authority to do and to continue in everything that the Father is willing to be. Okay? And that's a big statement right there. Because, remember, we have a Jewish community at this point that is very resistant to Christ as equal with God. Right, so Christ starts. It, it start, Christ is saying some astonishing things here, but he's starting by saying that all the things that God is willing and doing and accomplishing that that's my response. I get to. I do all those things. I am the the one who distributes all that. Right, all that authority has been given to me. Right, for that, for it to be handed over. Right, which means God God's like my will is being accomplished by you, Christ. Right, so um, it, it's kind of a I guess it would point to the sovereignty of Christ or like the equality of Christ with God in that moment. Um, he would, of course, you know, in the sense that Jesus, it would be blasphemous for Jesus to say that if he wasn't God, by the way. So this is an implicit claim to deity. I don't, I, I there's no other way to see that, right? If I, if I was walking around saying everything that God wills is under my authority to accomplish, no one's going to misconstrue that as uh, anything else but me saying that I'm equal with God. And just really imagine a situation that anyone speaks like that today. There's no misconstruing. So when people try to like uh, be in the Bible and say, well, no, Jesus didn't really claim to be God. I mean, even a more implicit situation like this, it's just so clear. I mean, someone walking around talking like that is very obvious that they're claiming to be not just one who does some of God's will, but is the one who distributes God's will and accomplishes it in its fullness. So, um, uh, I think that's implicit there. Uh, I mean, and, there's a reason why all the Pharisees accused him of blasphemy. Right. So. I agree with that. Um, if, if you go to John, there's that passage, of course, where he talks about um, before Abraham was, I am, and then after that, they pick up stones to stone him. That's just one of that's one of the clearest passages um, uh, as a claim to deity, because of course he said, "I am." Um, in that passage, when he said, "I am," he said Yahweh, which is the sacred word that the Jews wouldn't even say. Um, so that's why they tried to stone. They wanted to stone him in that moment. Um, 
So continuing on here, then we have, and no one knows the son except the father, nor does anyone know the father except the son and anyone whom the son wills to reveal him, right? So 20, it starts with saying, because so we just started 27 by saying that all things that the father wills to accomplish, all the authority that the father has been given to Christ, right? And then it says, no one knows the son except the father. Right. So it kind of establishes a special relationship between him and the father. Right. That like this is this is not this is not like a I'm not like you guys, basically. Right. I'm not like just a human being. Right. In this I am I am specially connected to the father. Right. But the more important uh, message here is nor does anyone know the father except the son. Right. And this would be a claim that, again, more astonishing to the people listening. Because what he's saying is, I, I Jesus, compared to you guys, I am the only one who really gets the Father. I, and I would imagine here the, the word knows is not an intellectual word. This is an intimate, uh, complete word. Um, more like we've talked about before, where, where um, when God uses no, even back in like... Uh, Genesis, or um, when the Bible uses no, when it says like Eve knew his, uh, Adam knew Eve, right? It's talking more about an into, intimate relationship, intimate love. It's not just talking about intellectual knowledge. So like when it says that, um, nor does anyone know the Father except the Son, it's saying nobody on the planet or in the universe intimately knows the Father the way I know the Father. Jesus is saying this. This is a claim to be way more than just a human being, right? And then he makes the, the most difficult claim, I, I'd say, for the people at the time, and anyone to whom the Son wills to reveal him. And that's hard, because what that's saying is, unless I, right, Jesus is saying that about himself, unless I choose to reveal the Father, right, to allow access to the Father to you, you have no ability to get to God. Jesus is claiming to be the only pathway to God in this moment. You understand? That's a hard thing to hear. There are no other now that is an offensive thing um in today in a different sense than it was then, but it in this, the same idea. It's an offensive statement. It's supposed to be. It's a divisive one. Because Jesus is saying to the Jews that unless you come through me, you can't know the God that you say you worship. And then he's saying in general, unless you know Christ, unless you know me, then there is no knowing God. There is no true relationship with God. That's an offensive statement because now every single person, every single organized religion that claims any other way to God is wrong, according even to this verse. Because you, you don't, you're not going through Jesus, but he's saying, I'm the only one who can reveal God to anyone. And I'm the only one who intimately knows the Father. And the Father intimately knows me, putting me in equality with Him. That's it. You go through me or you go nowhere. But that's hard today. Because today, in, in, um, you know, of course, there's, today there's all the people who are spiritually um, unconcerned, right? There's a big group of people who think there's no spiritual nature in the world at all like atheists and stuff like that but for the group of people that are very spiritual or seeking spiritually or um, have a bunch of different ideas about what god is or make up their own version of god that they like they're all wrong and no you there's no universalism not everybody gets to heaven you can't just do whatever you want you can't just follow whatever rule set you grew up with right? Even when it's hard, you can't just go with whatever you were raised in and think that, ah, this is just as good. I'm doing good things. I'm a better person. And therefore, this is an equal way to God. No, it's not. If the Bible is true, and I believe it is, and believe it's evident, then the only way to we know the Father is if the Son reveals Him to you. And the only way that the Son will reveal them to you as if you are an infant. And the only way you can be an infant is if you humble yourself before God and recognize who you are actually. And the gift of that comes from the Holy Spirit, at least in our, our current age, our current dispensation, to pull on some words. Um, but that's a hard message, right? It's a hard message. But um, it makes sense. It's it 
it uh, is a message that follows well with the denouncement of the cities, right? And his denouncement, um, and remember, you go back to earlier, right after he helped with John the Baptist, Doubt, who was a true seeker, right? Um, where he compared the generation, the current generation he was teaching to, to children in the marketplaces who were not responding to, um, uh, they wouldn't play in the happy games and they wouldn't play in the sad games. They wouldn't respond either way, right? They wouldn't respond, which is an analogy to, they wouldn't respond to John the Baptist. They wouldn't respond to Jesus, who John the Baptist would abstain from the comforts and the the, uh, the joys of this world. And Jesus, like it says, you know, he would eat and dine with prostitutes and sinners. And he would, um, when he'd not live it up in a sinful way, but he, you know, he would be friendly. He'd be, uh, he would be involved in the culture. Like, I mean, they wouldn't respond no way. They were indifferent, right? Um, so that's what he's responding to here, right? And it's a denouncement, of course, always of the Jewish leaders who were kind of the epitome of um, self-righteousness, right? So after that, okay, after he says all these things, he finally ends this particular discourse, right? Because chapter 12 will move us somewhere else. He ends this particular discourse with an, in discourse with an invitation, which I, I think is not unlike God, by the way. This is not unlike God. This is consistent with God almost across the entire Bible. I wish I had a passage in my mind from Ezekiel specifically so I could turn to it, but I know this, I recognize this in Ezekiel. I, I just don't think I have a passage specifically in mind that I can point to. But this idea of like, even after denouncement, even after promised judgment, along with all these very negative things, the Lord also always invites that you might come and repent and be saved. Um, to give you one example, um, uh, I, I want to be in the Old Testament on this, but I'll at least give you a New Testament example. If you go to Revelation, where he speaks to the seven churches, right? And remember, five of the churches are in sin. And one of the churches doesn't even have Christ in the church, right? That's why he says, I stand at the door and knock. If you let me in, I'll come in. Right? But to these churches, five of them, he denounces them. He calls them evil. He says they need to repent. He says that God is barely there or not there. Right? Um, but he, like, for example, to Laodicea, he says, I know your deeds. You're neither cold nor hot. You think you are rich, but you are poor. Right? Um, but then he, after all this denouncing of them, because they were, they actually were a good example of, they thought they were wise and intelligent and comfortable and wealthy and good. And, but they were really, um, uh, it says wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. Um, that's how Christ describes them. But then look at verse 19. It says, those whom I love, I reprove and discipline. Therefore be zealous and repent. I mean, even after this denouncing, there's a call to repentance. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If you, if you hear my voice and you open the door, I will come in. And he who overcomes, I'll grant to him to sit with me on my throne. So like, there's always this message, this final invitation. And if you go further into Revelation, if you go into, um, uh, actually, I'm, I'll just turn to it. Just to give you the example, too. Why not? Why not? Um, let me see where it's going to be. Uh, it's going to be... I know exactly what I'm thinking of. I'm trying to find the reference. Um, I think it's in the bowls of wrath. The, the bowls of wrath, sorry. Um... Okay. Sorry, I do want to find this though. Sorry. I think it might have been. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So, of all these judgments. In Revelation, this is coming some someday, uh, by the way. Um, but th this would be after many of the trumpets, right? Actually, all six trumpets, uh, six of the seven trumpets of judgment, after, of course, the six seals, seven seals of judgment. Um, so there's a lot of judgments, right? And so this is late in Revelation. We're in Revelation 14. And, and even at this point, you have this moment here, 
right? After just awful things have occurred, you know, th at this point, there's been a third of the earth killed. There's been the Antichrist everywhere, uh, murdering everybody, um, just to sum things up. But then you have this moment in Revelation 14. I can't imagine what this will look like in reality, but it says, And I saw another angel flying in mid-heaven, having an eternal gospel to preach to those who would live on the earth and to every nation and tribe and tongue and people. And he said with a loud voice, Fear God and give him glory, because the hour of judgment has come. I mean, even in a sentence, he's saying, Look, judgment's here. You guys deserve this judgment. It's literally here and coming. There's no more delaying. Fear God and give him glory. He's calling to, re um, to repentance at the same time. Worship him who made the heavens and the earth and the sea and the waters. Um, and at the same time, another angel, a second one followed, who I guess right after saying, fallen, fallen is Babylon the great, right? Um, if any, and the third says, whoever worships the beasts and his mark, um, and receives his mark will be poured out in him the, uh, in full strength, the wrath of God. Um, so, I mean, you have it again, even in Revelation at the end times, you have at the same time judgment pronounced. You have this invitation from God, even then, right at the end to believe. And this, um, again, if you go back through like a lot of Old Testament prophets, you'll get the same thing. The Lord will pronounce judgment on a city, on Israel, on a group of people. And at the same time, he'll then talk about how he's going to restore Israel. And then he's saying, oh, if they would only repent, if they would only listen to the prophets, I would love them and I'd restore them. Um, and with that, actually, in Israel's case, an actual promise of restoration that will eventually come. So um, it's always at the same time. And so we see it here by Jesus. He just calls these cities worse than um, they're going to have it the worst in hell. And then he says, come to me, right? So he's saying, come to me. He's saying, I am available, right? I just said I'm the only way. I'm the only one who knows God, right? I am the I am the only one who can reveal it to you. And then he's saying, come to me all, right? Come to me all, right? So he's giving this opportunity to everybody. But there's a catch, Right? This is a catch. And it says, come to me all who are weary and heavy laden. Right? Now, here's the problem. If you don't think you're weary and heavy laden, which means if you don't realize, right, that you are bearing the burden of the law and worn out by it and unable to keep it, which, um, can, again, context for that time, part of it is the fact that the, the Jewish people had been born extra law and more you know, impossible laws to keep as the Pharisees increased the law um, to ridiculous uh, proportions. And so they were bearing this burden. It, it talks about, I, I think I read from Matthew 23 last time where it, it literally says Jesus calls the Pharisees out for bearing harsh burdens on the Jewish people um, and just oppressing them in their own way. So part of it might be that, but just this general sense, because even for us, right? As Christians in the age of grace, we also bear this burden. We are also heavy laden when we're not saved. Um, not like the people who are not saved before they're Christians, because we're under that law and we can't keep it right. We still are under that moral law that, that Matthew five forty eight be perfect. Like your heavenly father is perfect. That's the standard. And, and that is a burden that would cause us to be weary and heavy laden because we can't keep it. Heavy laden just means um, again, it's like the same as weary in the sense that there's a lot of burden on us. We are laden with things that we can't really carry. We're under a great weight, right? So if you don't actually acknowledge that you are weary and heavy laden, just like, you know, you don't acknowledge that you're poor in spirit, Matthew 5, 3, then you can't come to me all. Because the all he's talking about are the all who realize that this is their condition. That's the catch. Now, it is true that all who've ever lived could have been humble enough and realized this and admitted this and then come to Christ. So in that sense, it can mean all, all. But the only all who will really respond to this come to me are the ones who are acknowledging that they are heavy laden with this law they can't keep. Heavy laden with their sin. And he says, and I will give you rest. So the, the invitation is to the all who re realize that they are burdened with their own sin. And the result is God will give them rest. Now this rest... Um, uh, and uh, actually, um, let's see if there's a note here that actually describes the rest the way I want to. Um, it 
you know, uh, John says here for about rest, he says, um, rest from the endless, fruitless effort to save oneself by the works of the law, right? So what I was just talking about, this speaks of a permanent respite in the grace of God, which is apart from works. And he, he gives me a reference in Hebrews here. So I'm just going to flip to this reference in Hebrews. Um, oh, I never flipped back on the, the stream to Matthew. So I'll look up Hebrews here. Um, so we can read this and just, just might give, I think, I think I remember looking at this and it's kind of complicated, but, um, it at least discusses this brief because this rest he's talking about, uh, is this, um, it's, it's a permanent rest and it's not a rest. Like sleep is a rest. It's a relief, right? It's a, um, it's a r release of the burden, right? The burden's being lifted off of you. That's why just afterwards he says, take my yoke. He's right. You're going to get rest. The, the burden's going to be released, but then take my yoke because it's learn from me because it's, it's, it's an easy yoke. It's not a burden, right? That's the rest. Um, but I'll read from Hebrews here so you can get a better sense. Hebrews 4, 1 to 3. Therefore, while the promise of entering rest, his rest still stands, right? Let us fear lest any of you should seem to have failed to reach it right? For good news came to us just as to them, but the message they heard did not benefit them because they were not united by faith with those who listened. For we who have believed have entered that rest. He has said, as I swore my wrath, they shall not enter rest. Although his works were finished from the foundation of the world. So this, this is making some other points too, about those who are believing by faith and those who are not, but it's saying the believers are entering that rest, right? The rest is, is an exclusive, thing for believers. And it kind of, again, reminds me of beginning of Matthew. It says, blessed are, blessed are, blessed are, right? That, And I talked about how that was an exclusive joy, an exclusive happiness that comes from uh, that poor in spirit attitude that leads to mourning and meekness and um, eventually uh, being persecuted and whatever. Um, I don't want to say whatever, but I mean, like, just to sum up all the Beatitudes, because it's an exclusive blessedness, right? that only comes when you are a believer, right? An exclusive rest that only comes when you're a believer because the only thing, um, or the only, uh, I guess that's not the best way to phrase it. I just want to phrase it like only believers can experience the release from their sin. Only believers can experience the freedom from having to pay for their sin, right? Justly. Uh, that's what I want to say. So Hebrews 6, I mean, Hebrews 4, 6, sorry. Um, says that since therefore it remains for some to enter it, that rest and those who formerly received the good news failed to enter because of disobedience. Uh, and then Hebrews um, 4, 9 to 11. Um, so then there remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God for whoever has entered God's rest has also rested from his works as God did from his, right? It's kind of like, uh, and that's uh, referencing Genesis, right? God worked for six days and created the world. Then he rested on the seventh. Now God didn't have to rest from his works the way we do, where God was, you know, needs a rest from a burden of doing wrong things, but it's making an analogy. It's, it's kind of playing words here. It's saying, you know, the way God rested on the seventh day, we can have that same rest, but instead of his rest was from creating the world where he got to experience the enjoyment of it and being done with it, we get the rest from our sinful deeds and are trying to obey the law. We get we get to be released from that, and we get to walk into the enjoyment and the freedom of Christ, right? Verse 11, let us stri therefore strive to enter that rest so no one may fall by the same sort of disobedience. So that's, uh, what, that's what I want to say about that. I th uh, Hebrews would be a fun book to study because there's... Um, hours more of material in that passage just by my quick look, but, uh, can't do that tonight. So, um, moving on. Here we are. Um, I will give you rest, right? And then, so, uh, 28 continues and follows pretty, uh, into 29 and follows pretty well. So we have this invitation to, to who we have it to all. And then what is the catch? What is the description of this all? Those who realize that they are weary and heavy laden, right? Those who are poor in spirit, in essence. And the result is they will get rest. Then there's a command, right? There's a, there's a following command to those people who have been given rest, right? It's a good description of the 
Christian life, right? You're saved and you're immediately in rest, right? Forever. But then what? What does a Christian life look like? You take my yoke, Christ's yoke, upon you and learn from him, right? That makes sense. The result of what you being saved is that you now learn from Christ. You now take his yoke on, right? His burden on, right? Which is no burden at all, right? For I am gentle and humble in heart. You will find, and you will find rest for your souls. That's a quote from the Old Testament. I'm not sure where, because it's not cited for me, and my notebook is gone. I think I mentioned this before. Um, For my yoke is easy and my burden is light, right? And the idea is there is that you're now swapping, Right, you now you now receive a yoke, and a yoke uh, I think is a word that simply means to describe the burden on um, the the oxen when they would plow the fields back then. Let's look up the old meaning of the word yoke. Make sure I have it. Um, it's a wooden beam sometimes used between a pair of oxen and other animals to enable them to pull together in a load when working in pairs. Right, so it's to describe that burden that those ox would have to take on because that would be the actual beam on top of them as they would pull and plow the fields. And and so it would be contextual to say yoke because they would understand what that means. They would because that's how they plowed back then. That's how they made. Um, that's how they worked the fields back then. So um, he's he's using the word yoke to show that. Um, okay, you have this current yoke on you, and it's it's a terrible burden, but now you're going to walk in this new yoke. It's my yoke, but this yoke is easy. It's not a big burden. It's not it's not a huge wooden beam. It's not an impossible to manage um, beam because I'm gentle and humble, right? He's describing himself. He says, "I you can learn from me because my yoke is easy because I am gentle and humble in spirit." Right, and I have the source of rest because I've been the one who revealed to you the Father, the only one who can do that. Right. So again, you, you see that contrast there between the current burden we're under in sin and the result of having Christ. Right. Um, it still is a yoke, though. Right. I mean, the Christian life is not um, easy. That's not what he's saying. He's not saying the Christian life is easy. The Christian life is not comfortable. That's not the point here. The point is, is that the Christian life is restful. Your soul is freed. Right? And you will enter in heaven that eternal fulfillment. Right? But even in heaven, the, the interesting thing about heaven, heaven is not just like a laziness, right? Where you have no, I don't want to say burden because there's no burdens in heaven, but you, it's not like you have, there's nothing that you're, that you're doing in heaven. Right? You still, in a sense, have a yoke because you're still, you're still doing things. You're still serving God. You're still working, in a sense. But remember, in, in heaven, it's perfect, and you're doing everything that God has made you to do, so you're going to do everything that's going to make you feel actually fulfilled. The reason in this life that when we, when we operate in this life and work or do things or pursue things, that we feel tired and unfulfilled is because first of all the world's imperfect we're moving towards death and we're not able to operate and do all the things that we were made to perfectly succeed at and love and be fulfilled in because we're in an imperfect place with imperfect opportunity and imperfect natures and imperfect bodies around all these other people that are the same right it when you're in heaven you're going to you're going to have not a rest where you're sleeping, but a rest where you're free and you're fulfilled, right? So um, I think that that kind of more paints the picture of what it's like in Christ. It's not an eternal sleep. It's an eternal... Um, it's, eternal it's an eternal perfection to where the rest is really fulfillment. I think that's the word that we need to use. So I think that uh, basically covers all those. Uh, if there's any questions or comments, then please say them. Ask them. Point to them right now, please. Um, any of you uh, who has them. Uh, if not, please everybody say in the chat if everything is understandable. What's up, Yonder GD? Um, so I know that everybody's understanding what I'm saying, and it's not like nonsense. Um so either say that or ask a question or make a comment. Do one of, everyone do one of those things right now. Um, and then we'll wrap up. All right, that's two people. 
and Cookie, I guess, reacted to something. <laughs> Just some typing, so I'm waiting. I don't know. I've never watched Frozen 2 because that doesn't make me feel rested. Um, what do you mean? No, I'm just messing, but I just haven't watched it. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, I don't know what you're referring to then. It's kind of like the one song that Olaf sang. The meme on the internet. I haven't heard the song, so I wish I wouldn't know. Huh? You'd have to send it to me. Maybe I can listen to it. All right. Well, no one seems to have any questions or comments. Um, so I guess people just absorb information and... Um, since no one said anything, I'm going to assume that everything made a ton of sense and was fruitful for you guys to learn. That's what I have to assume until I hear otherwise. Um, so cool. Then we'll wrap for tonight. We're going to get into Matthew 12 next week. Um, and we have, um, some interesting stuff coming up. Interesting stuff coming up. 12 is a lot of action going on there. Um, and more rebuking of the Pharisees. We're going to cover the unpardonable sin again um bless me the holy spirit which comes up in matthew in two different ways which is interesting and then um moving into the parables which again i'm super excited for because that's like the most misunderstood things um like uh passages of the bible most christians who are newer or just haven't studied carefully yet the bible um have no idea what's going on there so those will be fun. So, um, go ahead, Nighthawk. I just remember, though, like, when I, when you mentioned the parables, I immediately thought of Matthew 13. Like, I, I, I'm just thinking about the fact that, like, I remember, like, when I was younger, when we did, when I did Bible quizzing, like, Matthew 13 was, like, one of the chapters we had skipped. I was kind of disappointed. Anyway. Yeah, no, that has a lot of them. It has the, um, the sower with the four types of seeds. We have the tares among the wheat, the mustard seed, the leaven, the hidden treasure, the pearl, the dragnet. Um, and I think there's other parables later on. I mean, so much, so much going on, man. It's going to be crazy to move through all this. The 99 plus 1 is later. Um, laborers in the vineyard. And then we get towards the crucifixion. Um, which, uh, I wonder what month it will be when we get towards the crucifixion. I, like Matthew 26. I wonder where we'll actually be at. Um, there's a chance. Now, I'm not saying this is going to happen. But I'm just saying, based on our pacing, there is a chance that it will be next Easter <laughs> before we finish Matthew. Which I'm fine with, by the way. Because we're pretty fruitful here, um, I think. Um but it, it will be with probably before then or by then. So cool. there's nothing wrong with being thorough. Yeah. And, uh, searching through the Bible. Yeah. And uh, y'all keep coming, even though most of you don't say anything, y'all keep coming. So I'm assuming it's been good. Uh, so yeah, we're going to, I'm going to pray and then we'll end. Uh, Lord, I'm thankful that um, for this time that we get to, uh, share in your word. And I, I just pray for these people in the call. I don't know all these people in the call so deeply. I know them, some of them just n not super well, but I know them, Lord. And, and so I care about them, Lord. And I, I just care that they might know the word better, Lord, and really speak to them, speak to them and even encourage them in their own curiosity to go into the very passages we study and read them over and, and learn new things. Teach them by your Holy Spirit things, Lord, that I couldn't teach them because I can only I'm just a guy. I can only teach some things. And and so I pray that um, 
these passages come alive and convince them to even be fully more in your word. And um, I pray that Christ, being the only one who can reveal the Father, continues to reveal him to these um, these believers and call with me, Lord. And I ask um, all these things in your name. Amen. All right. That's all I got. So if there's nothing else. We'll end right here. Bye, guys. I'm in the